that was mathematical phenomenology from subjectivity to objectivity. Um, I need to do perhaps a disclaimer. I mean, you will not find like physical from from this, from subjective uh, principles or something like that. But it's going to be much more like a sketch and a switch of thinking. So hopefully we can motivate discussion. Hopefully we can perhaps learn something, and hopefully, um, yeah, I mean, we can uh, engage on this in this presentation. Um, so. So we'll start very, very quickly uh, with what we should focus, let's say, as a science of consciousness. Um, I will try to be very quick in the preliminary section because I, I supposed to, to have a little bit more time, but actually it didn't was the case. So uh, very quickly, I think that if we do a science of consciousness, we should focus, we should at least be, uh, be aware of the foundations. So that's it's working. Now. Uh, foundations of science is very important, and that what, what I try to say with foundations is also philosophy of science, philosophy of physics, philosophy of mathematics. That's uh, very important in order to understand the problematic of consciousness. Then, of course, we should engage with modeling, data analysis, experiments. It's not just that we do uh, empiri empirical empirical work and uh, and we don't know what happened with this uh, modeling or the other uh, way around. And finally, we need to engage with a kind of method, to uh, a sound method, to um, describe the phenomenology or the structure of experience. And this one, at least the one that I prefer, is the one that I will call mathematical phenomenology, and we will see what, what it means uh, with that. And of course, always theory experiment, theory experiment, that's something that we it's kind of must, must, must be. So, uh, if you want to have a, to see an example of how these kind of things work, this is a very recent paper where we mix uh, empirical data, uh, modeling, simulations, and also very abstract mathematics. And we try to do this uh, here as a proof of concept, let's say. And function here doesn't mean functionalism; it's just uh, functional data. Um, so, very quickly as well to put in context of this presentation. There are several models of consciousness, and we try to analyze, uh, with my colleagues Robert and Joanna, uh, we try to analyze uh, these models of consciousness in, uh, in the context of the philosophical background, or what they were in, implying or assuming. And like, as you can see here, for example, most of these models, they tend to have some physicalism background, and this is the neuroscientific models. But not only the neuroscientific models, so uh, 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 some quantum models as well, and uh, other type of models like IIT, TTC, rating, uh, processing, they share some, some, uh, let's say, uh, different aspects of, uh, of different type of uh, philosophy. So, for example, um, in the case of IIT that uh, we have a junior here. Uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting that some implications tend to, to, to interpret the theory as a fine psychism, but actually other, uh, it's very clear that it's uh, more physicalist. But some other readings could say that it's uh, following some idealistic position. In general, it's, not, it's neither, neither, uh, neither one nor the other one. So that's, uh, that picture is just to put in context uh, how difficult it's actually to classify certain models. And most interesting to me is that there are some models that like, could be interpreted like idealism in the consciousness model or phenomenology, which is not the main <coughs> stream of philosophy for, for, for this type of model. So the next step that we wanted to also do in order to, to have a, a contextual mixture of, of, of what we are doing, it's a, a classification map. I don't have time to, do in, to, do, to, to explain in detail all the different uh, um, dimensions here that we use in order to classify models of consciousness, but I will give you the picture, and, uh, and this is more or less what we, what we were trying to do, to classify models depending on what was the target of the explanation, if they, wanted to, if they were trying to explain quality or quantity, if they were using some functional assumptions or causal assumptions, the structure like more specific, 
or if they, if they were trying to assume an, a mechanistic explanation or a unificationist type of explanation. We can discuss these things, unfortunately, I would not have enough time to, to go in detail, but basically you get a picture that it looks kind of like this. The next step is to improve, of course, this classification map. These dimensions, dimensions are not necessarily exclusive all the time. And, and also we want uh, the author of this theory and the community rate these models and put, uh, put them in, in, in this type of framework. But this is to, 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 to give you a context that there is a, it's a very, very, like, uh, you, you see many different models, there are much more, and you can see how just with these three dimensions there is already like a, a, a huge spectrum of possibilities. Um, we also engage with uh, type of explanations. I think that it's very important to understand what are the type of explanations that models try to, to or focus or, or for, for the models are the satisfactory explanation. And we have just this recent uh, preprint where we try to do a critical review, let's say, of certain concepts in IIT. But basic, much more than IIT, it's, uh, it's the, the idea of, I don't know if you are familiar with the, the paper from Francesco Alia about um, the misplaced objectivity argument. And uh, actually, we agree with that, but we want to push a little bit harder in that direction. And that's why we say here, we need to explain subjective experience, but perhaps this explanation is not mechanistic. And that's it's kind of, uh, let's say, let's go deeper in what it means, and I would say like it's related to, to mathematics and type of constraint, constraint type of explanations, which is the third one here. So what is the connection with this, uh, all this context, let's say? Well, in science, we tend to assume that there is some objective reality there. And uh, one of the, the ways how to describe that objective reality is actually with mathematics. So mathematics would be ground kind of in objectivity, in truth, etc. I would try to contest that, and I'm not alone in this, and I would say that yes, mathematics can be ground, uh, sorry, science can be ground in mathematics. Uh, we agree with that, but mathematics is probably ground in intersubjectivity and therefore subjectivity. So let's, let's see what happened with this or what are the consequences of this is that if you take one or another, you could also take one of, one of, one of these two positions respecting to the, the problem of consciousness. Either you want to solve the question of consciousness, whatever it is, or whatever you, you think that it is. And in this case, it would mean you need to, to have a causal type of explanation, that would be a mechanistic type of explanation, either from the brain, or the body, or whatever, physical systems, etc. Or you try to dissolve the question. And the dissolution tends to be a type of constraint, uh, constraint type of explanation, which are not necessarily causal. The, the, in philosophy, we say that it's a, a causal or not causal. And mathematical explanations tend to have this type of uh, interesting aspect. So one one example is uh, life. So for example, there is not a causal explanation of life. There is a more, much more uh, constrained type of explanation. We know which are the proteins that are related with, with life, etc but we don't know exactly how to put all these proteins together in order to get life. So, the and, and it's not a problem anymore, that's why we speak about dissolution, because actually we can play around with these proteins, we can play around about different uh, aspects of life, and, and it's fine, we can, uh, we can uh, make progress of that without having any definition, definition of life, for example. Uh, neither causal type of explanation for life. So, with consciousness could be something similar, this is just an analogy. And, and why mathematics? What, if, what is the connection between mathematics and this constraint type of explanations? Well, we already use mathematics, isn't it? Like, that's why mathematical consciousness science. Well, there, is, there are some, some, some very interesting points about mathematics, the rigor and precision. So for example, if you have these three networks, with different colors, but the same number of nodes. You can describe that very precisely in mathematics using graph theory or multi-network theory, uh, yeah, multi, multi, multi layers network theory, etc. Mathematics constraint theories, that's something that uh, we actually, it's a, we want, let's say, we can constrain theories depending on the mathematics that we use, etc. 
And the most important for most people here is that uh, you can infer and extrapolate predictions thanks to the mathematics. But in consciousness science, what I would say is much more important than infer, inference and extrapolation for prediction <coughs> is that we can naturalize uh, the, phen uh, the phenomenology of experience. And what I, what I mean with naturalization is that there are some structural components of uh, phenomenology, like subjective experience, past subjective experience, and some uh, structural components of the physical world, the, the, the biological world, etc., that they don't match. And, and naturalization means how we can actually make that all these things are together in the same framework. And if you haven't read already this book, Naturalization Phenomenology, quite old, but quite contingent, I think that you say, very, 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 it's a very interesting, heavy book. I would recommend to have a look, especially if you are a mathematician. Um, and if you haven't read Mathematizing Phenomenology, I would also recommend it because uh, several points that I'm making here come from this, from this discussion. And eventually you will also like to read the Beyond Science, which is the next paper where we are planning to, to go deeper in, in, in what we will see in the next slides. So mathematical consciousness science, yes, amazing. In the last three years, we have done a lot of progress, a lot of things, this, the community, etc. There are several uh, subfields in the mathematical consciousness science, and I will just name four, because this is how I see it, but open to, to, to discussion. So I think that we can apply mathematics to formalize models, and there are several examples here. We can use computational techniques, mathematical computational techniques, techniques to analyze data, to, re, uh, to formalize uh, certain analysis in the data as well, and here there are a few, a few examples. We can also use mathematics to constrain the relationship between physics and, and, and experience, and then also here are a few, a few examples. And the most interesting, and that's why the title of this presentation, I think that we can also uh, engage in what I would call mathematical phenomenology. And here there are a couple of examples. Um, in gray, why well, in gray? Because it's like the gray sound. It depends on how we make the interpretations in the next slides. So what is mathematical phenomenology? Mathematical phenomenology needs to be ground in, in, in continental phenomenology, let's say. Um, a phenomenon is an appearance and therefore something intrinsically related. Um, grounding logic in mathematics uh, and mathematics in phenomenology is different than applying logic and mathematics to phenomenology. One thing is application, another one is uh, grounding. Um, and then phenomenology aims to uncover the principles of organizations that guarantee invariance, qualitative invariance, phenomenal invariance. So this, I, I would say, like there are key points uh, to distinguish what would be mathematical phenomenology from application of mathematics to, to, to phenomenology. And something that is very interesting uh, in this type of framework is that the physical world and the mental world, whatever you want to call it, are constraining each other. There is not something about uh, existence or ontology discussion here it's like, whatever it is, I just bracket what, what it is. I don't care about what it is itself. I will care about the relationships that they in, entail between them. And one example to, to understand this constraint, at least from the phenomenological perspective, phenomenological Alan Husserl, um, it's this uh, example with the container and, and, and the liquid, let's say. So let's imagine like mine, it's a container and it's transparent. And inside you put a liquid which will represent the physical world or something like that. So then you can ask what is the shape of the object of the liquid or whatever. Well, the shape would be given by the, the container. But then you can also ask what is the color of the container. And if it's transparent, then the color will be uh, the color of the liquid that you put inside. And depending how you play with these relationships, either you are just looking to one aspect that could be physics or mental, or the combination of the two. And in order to understand the mental, for example, you should find, try to find the physicals that are transparent to the mental. 
that's more or less the, the analogy. And that's the way how to proceed to understand or to find the phenomenal invariants that then are key components of this, this, this structure or this framework. So basically, to summarize, mathematical applications use phenomenology in the sense of subjective experience. But mathematical phenomenology use phenomenology in the sense of the systematic study of subjective experience. It implies that there is a method and there is a philosophical commitment. Um, of mathematical applications use mathematics as operations, operational use. And in that sense, you tend to use uh, quantitative mathematics you assume that there is a true existence, ontological something. Um, you tend to assume that there are unique set of axioms. Phenomenology is finite. You can describe phenomenology with a set of uh, finite set of axioms. Deductive inference is, is sufficient. And scientificality, which would mean science or the scientific method or the scientific reasoning, is the best. Basically. But for mathematical phenomenology, you don't have these things, actually, it's not much, much more or less the opposite. You expect to have qualitative and descriptive mathematics. Uh, you bracket existence, you don't discuss that, that point. Uh, you assume that axioms are contextual. Phenomenology is not finite. Um, deductive inference does not suffice. It's not enough, let's say. And you you take care about science, the scientific method, but you also take care about other possibilities, other type of reasons, other type of thing. So that's a, that kind of that's kind of the picture and, and, and what entails one and the other. And I think it's important because here we are. I mean, it's a mathematical community. We are here because we like rigor and precision. So we should call uh, whatever we do with precision and rigor as well. And these are the the, the concepts how. We can, I mean, we should uh, use them as umbrella, let's say, to, to define certain fields uh, and, uh, and our work, of course. So what are the consequences? Uh, I think that you already guessed what are they, them. Um, so first, the primacy of experience. The experience is fundamental, but not less complex. Um, the blind spot of science, which means, mainly means that we cannot uh, explain everything from, from, from science itself. itself uh, science cannot uh, see from, in, from, from inside, let's say. So we need to, 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 to have other perspective as well. And logic, truth, and proof originate in the process of rational cognition. Um, and saying that, we need to study the experiential invariants and we need a sound method in order to do that. And the question, finally, everything is about the method here. What is this method? So rather, rather than naively accepting mathematical and logical subconcepts as foundations for knowledge, we first trace these concepts back to their source of intuitions and, if necessary, subject, subject them to critical revision. I think that that summarizes all the presentation. I think that I can finish here. I think it's, uh, it will be perfect. But uh, there is more. <laughs> <laughs> I know uh, how, the time, how, it's, uh, um, how much time I have. I, how much? If you are, if you are motivated, I, I, I can continue. So. Okay. I, I, I can delay uh, maybe five minutes. Okay. So, but then, well, um, well, here there is a slightly, slightly problem with the, the presentation. But that's why I have this picture here, basically. So, when we speak about mathematics and the foundation of mathematics, then. There are several theories, but I would say like this one, the inferential theory from Octavio Bueno. It's one of the, the most promising ones to understand how, how, how mathematics works. And it's not, well, there are a lot of philosophical questions there, but I would give you just a, 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 a quick review of that. Basically, you have an empirical system with different structure, and you have three different processes. Immersion, which translates empirical setup to a mathematical structure, Derivation, which basically gives you new structures related to predictions, etc., and interpretation. And all these three presuppose a mind, presuppose an experiential entity. And then you can, from, from this process here, define a model one, 
but then you can extrapolate a second model, second mathematical model based on whatever you understood or learned from this mathematical model to a model two and a model three. And that's how actually, uh, that's the claim of Octavio, of course, that's how um, mathematical knowledge, knowledge is constructed. So you start from very basic cognitive processes and then you go uh, in history and time and you construct uh, more complex uh, mathematical structures, etc. But all these all these things here, like I said before, there is, uh, let's say, some mind, some mathematician there. And this mathematician, of course, let's say, uh, this mathematician, of course, uh, the brain of this mathematician needed to go uh, to the process of evolution need to go to the process of development, and on top of that, it's the process of uh, accumulation of knowledge, which is here on, on, on top of that one, actually, is the base here, but just because of the space. And this is what people would call intersubjectivity in the sense of the construction of these mathematical concepts are based on different levels of explanation as well, biological, but also historical, and even anthropological. So when we try to understand how we use mathematics, um, it's not the, just that we just, I mean, came up with some uh, stru mathematical structure. There is, a, there is a huge amount of accumulation of knowledge, cognition, development, etc., that, that made us actually to, to came up with this mathematical structure. And the claim here would be that if we go back, step back, into what are the primitives of mathematics, if we go back and actually in, in the history of mathematics is actually going to the future in, in the history of mathematics, we found a uh, category theory. And category theory is a very general structure, very simple structure, and because of this simplicity, you can generalize different mathematical structures. Yeah. And what is super interesting is, interesting is that when you go to conceptual primitives uh, for cognition, you get this type of pictures here. And then when you go to monoidal categories, you get these type of structures here. Then, then I shouldn't, I think, that explain the analogy. It's almost, almost evident. That's why I put the pictures. But of course, we can discuss the mathematics behind it. Too. So what is the, the experiential primitives then? It would be diagrams as experiential primitives, where the experience is fundamental, and where there is a mapping between physics and experience. And what are the phenomenal invariants uh, of this primitive, uh, well, and then the question is what are the phenomenal invariants and their cognitive capacities such that the invariants make possible the appearance of nature and nature informs the environment, the mutual constraint that we were speaking before. So what is the method and what is method mathematical phenomenology in that sense, like a big picture? It's, a, it's also a method where you, you need to first start from phenomenal inquiry. So you need to take the, the, the subjective experience of each, each one of us, but in relation as well between us. Um, from that, you will get the phenomenal invariance. From this phenomenal invariance, you will match with mathematical mapping these processes that, that I mentioned before. And finally, with these mappings of mathematical primitives, you will be able to compose uh, much complex phenomenal structures. And eventually, and that's the, the, that we expect, and that's why I say it's just a sketch, eventually subject, uh, objectivity just emerged from free. Basically because we already have all, most of the, the physical theories uh, mapped into these categorical structures, and we are just doing a step back and say, well, these categorical structures are just uh, experiential ones. So if we, if, if we take that, then we don't need to, to do much, actually, the objectivity from intersubjectivity is given for free. So that's why the conclusion here, and that's the last slide. I would like to replace the implicit assumption that mathematical knowledge grounds on objectivity for a more explicit assumption that mathematics, mathematical knowledge grows in intersubjectivity. And that's all. Thank you very much. Sorry if I didn't.